by Kali Weed.
fragmentation of maturity the great change in youth we were whole and the terror and pain of the world there was no sharp separation between joy We went down into an ocean, drowned out completely, clutching the stars and the people of the deep. And then comes a time when suddenly all seems to be reversed. We live in the mind, in ideas, in practice. No longer drink in the wild, out of music. to give us a choking glimpse of the world. Perhaps then we have the first intimation of the great impact of sin. The first intimation that here over little round tables spinning in the light. Our feet, I think, scraping the soil. Our hands touching the cold stem of a glass. That here, over these little green, little round tables, which later we had to look at with such yearning and reverie, that here, I say, we had to feel in the years to come the first time of love. First stains of rust, first black, flowing, and bright circular pieces of thin in the the gone sweet colored chin, the bare entry that lashes out in the summer sun, and scream and shake as 
the rain beats down. While out of hot earth, the snails float away miraculously. And all the air turns here over the legs and eyes, with furry and me, picking up the slightest clue and memory of the past. In the aimless to and fro, we pause now and then, like long, sticky plants, and we swallow whole the light morsels of soft. We open up soft and healing. Drink in the night and oceans of blood which drown the sea of our life. We drink and drink with an insatiable thirst. We are never whole again, but living in fragments, and all our parts separated by thinness. It is the whole saga of you, flashing before your eyes, the dream of the open street and the sound of gulls wheeling and diving with garbage in your eyes, or it's the sound of the trumpet and flag, all the unknown parts of the world, before your eyes without days or like the table top Day comes when you stand on the Brooklyn Bridge, looking down into black funnels, belching smoke, and the gun barrels gleam, and the buttons gleam, and the water divides miraculously. And the sharp cutting brow, and like ice and lace, like a breaking and a smoking, the water turns green and blue with a cold incandescence, with the chill of champagne and burnt and the brow leaves the water. In an unending metaphor, the heavy body of the vessel moves on, with the prow ever dividing, and the weight of her is the unweighable weight of the world, the sinking. Down 
Lenny Paul was the living odyssey of the 14th Ward, that he later became a truck driver is an irrelevant fact. Before the great change, no one seemed to notice that the streets were ugly or dirty. If the sewer mains were open, you held your nose. If you blew your nose, you found snot in your handkerchief and not your nose. There was more of inward peace and contentment. There was the saloon, the racetrack, bicycles, fast women and trot horses. Life was still moving along leisurely. In the 14th ward at least, Sunday mornings no one was dressed. If Mrs. Gorman came down in her wrapper with dirt in her eyes to bow to the priest, Good morning, Father. Good morning, Mrs. Gorman. The street was purged of all sin. Pat McCarran carried his handkerchief in the tail flap of his truck coat. It was nice and handy there, like the shamrock in his button. The foam was on the lag and people stopped to chat with one another. In my dreams, I came back to the 14th ward as the paranoid returns to his obsessions. When I think of those steel grey battleships in the Navy Yard, I see them lying there in some astrologic dimension in which I am the gunsmith, the chemist, the dealer in high explosives, the undertaker, the corona, the cuckold, the sadist, the loyal contender, the scholar, the restless one, the jolt head, and the brazen face. Where others remember of their youth, a beautiful garden, a fond mother, a sojourn at the seashore, I remember with a vid- vividness as if it were etched in acid. The grim, suit-covered walls and chimneys of the tin factory opposite us and the bright circular pieces of tin that was strewn in the street, some bright and gleaming, others rusted, dull, copperish, leaving a stain on the finger. I remember the iron works where the red furnace glowed, and men walked toward the glowing it with huge shovels in their hands, while outside were the shallow wooden forms like coffins with rods through them on which you scraped your shins or broke your neck. I remember the black hands of the iron molders, the grit that had sunk so deep into the skin that nothing could remove it. Not soap, nor everything, nor money, nor love, nor death. Like a black mark on it. Walking into the furnace like devils with black hands and later with flowers over them, cool and rigid in their Sunday suits. Not even the rain you can wash away the grit. All these beautiful gorillas going up to God with swollen muscles and limbago and black hands. For me, the whole world embraced in the confines of the 14th ward. If anything happened outside, it either didn't happen or it was unimportant. If my father went outside that world to fish, it was of no interest to me. I remember only his boozy breath when he came home in the evening and opening the big green basket spilled the squirming, goggle-eyed monsters on the floor. If a man went off to the war, I remember only that he came back of a Sunday afternoon and standing in front of the minister's house, puked up his cup and then wiped it up with his breath. Such was Rob Ramsey, the minister's son. I remember that everybody liked Rob Ramsey. He was the black sheep of the family. They liked him because he was a good-for-nothing and he made no bones about it. Sundays or Wednesdays made no difference to him. You could see him coming down the street under the drooping awnings with his coat over his arm and the sweat rolling down his face. His legs wobbly with that long steady roll of a sailor coming ashore after a long cruise. The tobacco juice dribbling from his lips together with warm silent curses and some loud and foul ones too. The utter indolence, the insocrence of the man, the obscenities, the sacrilege. Not a man of God like his father. No, a man who inspired love. His frailties were human frailties and he wore them jauntily, tauntingly, flauntingly, like banderillas. He would come down the warm open street with the gas mains bursting and the air full of sun and shit and oaths. And maybe his fly would be open and his suspenders undone or maybe his vest bright with vomit. Sometimes he came charging down the street like a bull skidding on all fours and then the street cleared magically as if the manholes had opened up and swallowed their offer. Crazy Willie Main would be standing on the shed over the paint shop with his 
pants down, jerking away for dear life. There they stood in the dry electrical crackle of the open street with the gas mains bursting. A tandem that broke the minister's heart. That was how he was then, Rob Ramsey. A man on a perpetual street. He came back from the war with medals and with fire in his car. He was puked up in front of his own door and he wiped up his puke with his own vest. He could clear the street quicker than a machine gun. For Abala, that was his way. And a little later in his warm-heartedness, in that fine careless way he had, he walked off the end of a pyre and drowned himself. I remember him so well in the house he lived in. Because it was on the doorstep of Rob Ramsey's house that we used to congregate in the warm summer evenings and watch the goings on over the salon across the street. A coming and going all night. A coming and going all night long and nobody bothered to pull down the shades. Just a stone's throw away from the little girl in the house called the bump. All around the bump were the salons. And Saturday nights there was a long line milling and pushing and squirming to get at the ticket window. Saturday nights when the girl in blue was in her glory, some wild tar from the Navy Yard would be sure to jump out of the seat and grab up one of the military lonely cars. And a little later that night, they'd be sure to come strolling down the street and turn in at the family entrance. And soon they'd be standing in the bedroom over the salon pulling off their tight pants the women yanking off their corsets and scratching themselves like monkeys while down below they were stuffing the studs and biting each other's ears off and such a wild shrill laughter all bottled up inside there like dynamite evaporated. All this from Rob Ramsey's doorstep, the old man upstairs saying his prayers over a kerosene lamp, praying like an obscene nanny goat for an end to come. Or when he got tired of the rain coming down in his nightshirt like an old lefty corn and be laying on with a broomstick. From Saturday afternoon on until Monday morning, it was a period without end. One thing melting into another. Saturday morning already, how it happened, God only knows. You could feel the war vessels lying at anchor in the big place. Saturday mornings, my heart was in my mouth. I could see the death screen struck down and the guns polished and the weight of those big sea monsters resting on the dirty glass lake of the basin was a luxurious weight on me. I was already dreaming of running away, of going to far places, but I got only as far as the other side of the river, about as far north as 2nd Avenue and 28th Street via the belt lights. There I played the orange blossom, waltz and in the undrag I washed my eyes at the iron sink. The piano stood in the rear of the salon. The keys were very yellow and my feet couldn't reach to the pedals. I wore a velvet suit because velvet was the order of the day. Everything that passed on the other side of the river was sheer. The sanded floor, the blonde lamps, the mica pictures in which the snow never melted. The crazy Dutchmen with steins in their hands. The iron sink that had grown such a mossy coat of slime. The woman from Hamburg, whose ass always hung over the back of the chair. The courtyard choked with salt crud. Everything in three-quarter time that goes on forever. I walked between my parents with one hand in my mother's muff and the other in my father's. My eyes are shut tight. Tightest clamps which draw back their lids only to weep. All the changing tides and weather that passed over the river are in my life. I can still feel the slipperiness of the big handrail which I leaned against in fog and rain, which sent through my cool forehead the shrill blasts of ferry boat as she slid out of the slip. I can still see the mossy planks of the ferry slip buckling as the big round prow grazed her side, and the green juicy water sloshed through the heaving groaning planks of the ship. And overhead the seagulls wheeling and diving a dirty noise with their dirty beaks, a hoarse praying sound of inhuman feasting, of mouths fastened down on the fuse of scabby legs, skimming the green churned water. One passes imperceptibly from one scene, one age, one life to another. Suddenly walking down a street, be it real or be it a dream, 
one realizes for the first time that the years have flown that all this is past forever and will live on only in memory and then the memory turns inward with a strange clutching brilliance and one goes over these scenes and incidents perpetually in dream and in reverie while walking the street while lying with a woman while reading a book while talking to a stranger suddenly but always with terrific insistence and always with terrific accuracy these memories intrude rise up like ghosts and permeate every fiber of one's being hence forward everything moves on shifting levels our thoughts our dreams our actions our whole life a parallelogram in which we draw from one platform of our scaffold to another hence forward we walk split into myriad fragments like an insect with a hundred feet a centipede with soft stirring feet that drinks in the atmosphere we walk with sensitive filaments that drink avidly a past and future and all things melt into music and sorrow we walk against a united world asserting our divided all things as we walk splitting the dark and the mire is the distant track the great fragmentation of nature the great change in youth we were hope and the terror and pain of the world penetrated us through and through there was no sharp separation between joy and sorrow they fused into one as our waking life fuses with dream and sleep we rose one being in the morning and at night we went down into an ocean drowned out completely clutching the stars and the fever of the day.
Thank you.